So is Cam Spencer the replacement for Jalen Clark, or are they finding someone else? Let's talk about it on Locked On UCLA. You are Locked On UCLA, your daily podcast on the UCLA Bruins. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, everybody, to the Locked On UCLA Podcast. I'm Zach anderson Yoxheimer. Thanks for making this your first listen each and every day. It's free wherever you get your podcast, and it's available on YouTube. So like, comment, and subscribe. Zach is back. We're in the month of June now. How is that already happening in 2023? And so much has happened already. The month of May has come and gone. NBA draft withdrawal deadline has come and gone. And now we have a clearer picture as to what UCLA basketball is going to look like in 23-24. By no means is the roster set and complete. We're still waiting on a Damara who is beginning his termination process. More on that in a moment. And then you've got that spot to fill. Jalen Clark. We got a Dembona back. That was key. The reigning Pac-12 freshman of the year. And you've got a, quite a few international recruits. Freshmen freshmen turning into sophomore. Sophomores. Lazar Stefanovic is a transfer coming in. And... It'll be a bit of a new look roster. That's been the the story all off season long as we drift into the off season of 23 to, to now 24, the last year of UCLA fully in the Pac-12. Well, what does this mean? Looking at Cam Spencer, that's the guy who UCLA is clearly targeting to fill this spot in the void left by Jalen Clark. His skills, I would say, are a little different. Then what Clark provided, a more lethal shooter, 43% from three, a 13 points per game score, one of the quote-unquote best players left in the entire transfer portal. And I know it changes by the day and all these things, but he is one of those guys that could truly fill a role for UCLA in this upcoming season. Got a few visits left between the Miami, a UConn, Oklahoma, and UCLA. That was tweeted out by Jeff Goodman. And if you want to kind of go up and down, this is a guy who's coming from Rutgers, started with Loyola, Maryland. And while the Bruins have that connection with Ivo Samovic, one wonders if they are amongst the top on his list. And I still, I'm not sure when and if, when and he, when he's visiting Westwood, but that would be a key guy to get. If you can take the, the burden of shooting off of, say, only Stevanovic, maybe Andrews can improve that three-point shooting numbers and, I'm not really sure at this point of Mars' stretch for ability to hit the three consistently. But if UCLA can get another shooter, right? Last year, they didn't have that consistent three-point shooter outside of David Singleton. And if they can get Spencer, you can add Stefanovic's ability to hit the three, bring in one of the better three-point shooters you could find left in the portal, and all of a sudden, you might have a full rotation while you wait for a day Mara to kind of begin and get through this arduous, it seems like, process as he terminated his European contract. And while I think I read that his European contract did his team, it is going to make it a little bit tough for him in terms of terminating the contract to come to the U.S. to play college basketball. And while nothing is quote-unquote official for him to turn into a UCLA Bruin, all signs, everything points to him heading to Westwood. Those are the plans but until everything is dry, ink, set, and paper, he is officially a Bruin. We've seen this already work against UCLA. There's still two roster spots to fill. I think Spencer is probably the right guy to go after. I just wonder, what's UCLA's plan B, right? I guess this is a plan B. If you didn't expect Jalen Clark to come back, there was some signs a few weeks ago that he might. But after all said and done, it, it was rehab and continue his professional dreams or to aspiring his professional dreams where now you're going after plan B. What's that plan C, right? When there's no Spencer, if he goes somewhere else, gets a better NIL deal, someone promises more playing time, whatever it is, however he's wooed, he's going to take his time and decide later on in the year so, or later on in the summer when UCLA is still trying to fill two spots pretty late in the recruiting cycle for the class of 23, I think he would fit nicely. I've already read his stats quite a few times, but that is the guy they're replacing. They're trying to get to replace the guard of Jalen Clark. And while 
Clark was listed as 6'5". He ended up at the draft combine only 6'4". So while maybe Spencer isn't necessarily that defensive presence Clark could bring, he is someone who can hit the three. Now what we're all salivating about is a day Mara coming. And while UCLA would need somebody to take care of the basketball and bring it up the floor, the front court will be a Dembona, most likely a day Mara, but it's not set in stone yet. 7'3", uber athletic, 6'10". Hopefully impossible to score in the Bruins in the paint. And they can be so dominant getting rebounds and stopping teams in the paint. You'd have to shoot lights out from three just initially to beat UCLA from downtown, in my mindset, of this team going into next year. Now, how are they going to get some guard scoring? Could they be one of those teams that's vulnerable to an early round failure or one of those teams that falters when their guard scoring isn't truly as good? Now, Spencer, if he comes over from Rutgers, it would be his third school, his grad transfer year. He can help fulfill that void. And I know a lot of us have been going back and forth, whether it be in the comments or just thinking out loud about the importance of Dylan Andrews scoring the basketball. That's a lot of show, That's a lot to put on the load of a sophomore guard coming in. And while there's McClendon and there's other players who will have to step up, there's still a lot of unknowns in the backcourt and still a, two spots to open. The, they're for the taking. They're right there. And UCLA can fill them out, become a very good team. And mind you, they're going to the Maui Jim Maui Invitational this year. Something I completely forgot about in the fall of 23 over around the, the Thanksgiving, the feast week, if you will, a uh, holiday for college basketball fans during the kind of the beginning, slight peak, the beginning upward trajectory of the holiday season. And if UCLA is to compete with some of those very good teams out in Maui, in the North Carolina game, and I believe hosting Maryland, those are some tough games in the schedule where they're going to get tested early and often. That, that, that Again, I'm not thinking this is a team that has a similar record to this season. It could be a little bit different, double-digit losses heading into the postseason. Or they could completely shock me, gel together immediately, go on this European international trip during the summer, right, and completely gel and turn into a very good team. I'm not sure it'll click early. I think this is a team that will have to build late, replacing Clark, replacing a Jaime Hawkins Jr., a Singleton, replacing Amari Bailey, who we would have loved to have another year. Otherwise, you're not even talking about a Cam Spencer or a Jalen Clark. But that's the reality of the situation. They're so good. All these players had either peak seasons or peak moments or had been around so long that they wanted to go take their the next step in their in their journey of their basketball career. You just have to applaud them for their efforts. So Spencer is the key guy who they're going after to replace Clark. Mara seemingly on his way here to give the Bruins a dominant potential front court. But Spencer, between four power five, power six conference teams, can the Bruins win that battle? In the class of 23 recruiting guys, they lost Isaiah Collier to USC. They lost all these other recruits to other schools across the country. So what makes us think that in the portal that Spencer is going to choose the Bruins over a, a Miami, a UCLA, or an o Oklahoma, a UConn, the defending national champions, and a Final Four team, Oklahoma, who could easily shell out some bucks, shell out in quotes. Those are all things he's going to consider. And while the Bruins clearly have a void, and especially with Clark, they could probably say, hey, Look, we've got this opening right here. You can take it. It's up to the point guard, up to the guard to come and choose to be at UCLA. You can go up and down all the lists, but that is their target. And if they don't get him, then at some point, the class of 23 recruiting, there's something a little off with this season because if there's multiple guys they went after and they couldn't get, I wonder what that means for the future. If they're just going to start plucking even more guys from overseas, which they've already done, and then some here in this recruiting class. In the meantime, we're going to transition more into some UCLA football because there's been some drama brewing ever since 2021. What's the drama from the UCLA football side of things? I'm pretty sure you remember, but now there's a lawsuit involved and everybody in the Pac-12 isn't happy about it. I'll tell you about that more after I tell you about FanDuel because, you know, we're heading to the finals. It's the Nuggets. You've got the Heat. Who would have known what's going to happen in the NBA? You know, who's going to win the title? And right now, you've got to go rush to FanDuel, become a new customer, because you get a no-sweat first bet up to $2,500 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. Again, let me repeat that. $2,500 
in bonus bets. If your first bet doesn't win, there's no better place to bet all the action in America's number one sports book, fanduel.com slash locked on. Again, fanduel.com slash locked on, the official sports betting partner of the NBA and with us here at Locked On. Cruising on into segment two of Locked On UCLA. And well, UCLA football's in a bit of some drama. It's been a couple of years. Happened in late 2021, and for some reason, these bowl games have not been fun. Whether it was the one the Bruins played in late 2022 and they couldn't hold on to the lead, or in 2021 where everybody was either driving, like my family was, to go to the game in San Diego that day, was already enjoying the festivities of the Holiday Bowl in 2021, December, and that was when the COVID surge had kind of happened. There were bowl games getting canceled, basketball games getting canceled. We had already had, quote-unquote, reopening day, if you remember what that was, in June, mid-June, especially in California and Los Angeles, the reopening day. And then six months later, we were almost practically beginning to shut down during the holiday season again. And UCLA, remember, they pulled out of the Holiday Bowl late in that in the situation, just a couple hours before they were set to play a, a very angry NC State team. And there's been various different arguments that whole oh, UCLA, they're enjoying all the festivities and that hours before they wanted to get their gifts and play and all these things. Those are all different things I got to dive a little deeper in. But UCLA, they were all of a sudden pulling out. And then the Holiday Bowl got so mad at the Pac-12 and UCLA pulling out, they didn't give Oregon their money for playing in the Holiday Bowl in 2022 against North Carolina. So the Pac-12 was going to sue the Holiday Bowl overall, the bowl, and the organizers for not giving Oregon their money when the Holiday Bowl first sued the Pac-12 because of UCLA's non-compliance, inability in what they could just deem, I believe, negligence in calling off the game hours before. And we can have different debates about this, but it's just a funny little drama with what UCLA was dealing with in, in 2021. They're getting sued, and one of the things is, they were pulling out, and the Holiday Bowl, they've pretty much just left Oregon with no money. And what's funny is then UCLA left the Pac-12 high and dry because they're going to the Big Ten. So everybody's mad at UCLA, of course, at SC2. But the Bruins are drawing the ire of the situation. And while they're going to point the finger at saying, hey, you knew and you're hanging out and doing different things, enjoying all the festivities and canceling the game, UCLA is going to say it was for health reasons, and all those conversations will go back and forth, accusing, pointing the finger. And at some point, there is possibly a world where UCLA may have to pay some money or the Pac-12 and all these things. And that's a little above my head, legal jargon and everything. I got to dive a little deeper into that. But I just thought it was kind of funny. It's two years after the fact that Pac-12 was about to sue the Holiday Bowl, only for them to get sued before. One wonders if there will be one side counter suing the other and then it just ends in some settlement and just everybody with glaring eyes watching UCLA walk out the door saying, oops, we're getting paid. We're going to be in a better conference and doesn't really matter because our athletic department deficit will just decrease by simply making this move. See you later. And Oregon's meanwhile sitting in Eugene saying, but what about our money? We played in this game and we had a great game. and It was an entertaining one, I believe, if I remember correctly, against North Carolina. And they're left without a couple million, although I think Oregon can handle being without a couple million. But still, it's all a little mumbo-jumbo drama behind the scenes. And, well, UCLA is involved in another lawsuit. Remember, they had that big battle and settlement with Under Armour. Now, here they are in, a, in the midst, the focal point of this lawsuit because they pulled out of the Holiday Bowl. And there's so many different ways you can go about this. It's just what's going on right now. We'll see how it plays out and how much it affects or does not affect UCLA going forward. But in the meantime, it's fun to stew about. Cruising on into Locked On segment, Locked On UCLA segment number three. My goodness, who knows? You take a day off, you're doing different things, and then you sit here and you're like, man, what, what is Zach doing? The, the Bruins, their football team in 2023, has actually had their non conference games. And their times actually laid out and complete opposite of what we saw in 2022. I think all these times are fair and people heading to the Rose Bowl should be there. There should be enough prime time viewing for the Bruins. I think these should all be entertaining products 
one way or another for the start of the 2023 season for Chip Kelly and whoever is at quarterback and the quote unquote number one running back in the transfer portal, Carson Steele, most likely starting right behind whoever's taking the snaps. You've got Coastal Carolina, game one, week one at 7.30 ESPN televised. And then you've got San Diego State. That's at San Diego State and Snapdragon Stadium. 4.30 against the Aztecs on CBS. And then NC Central, while it is a Pac-12 network game, is at 2 p.m. As the Bruins, you know, they're not getting any 11 a.m. starts. And while generally that September weekend, that Labor Day weekend is brutal, absolutely brutal, when it comes to heat, I remember going to that game last year against Bowling Green. Nobody was in the stadium. And if you hadn't lost half your water weight by the time the first quarter ended, you did by the second. And if you're still sitting in the sun, I applaud you. I could only do it for two quarters, and I had to go sit in the shade. And I stayed that whole game against Bowling Green, but I would not recommend just sweating it out during 120-degree heat, like whatever that day was, one of the hottest days ever in a pretty weird game where the Bruins played terribly and still won by like 30 to 40 points against Bowling Green. Now you get the Coastal Carolina game, a little bit more prime time. Everybody will have more eyes. West Coast, that West Coast window, Pac-12 after dark. One final week one ever for UCLA in the Pac-12. But then you play the Chanticleers, Grayson McCall. That will be a sneaky good game to test the, the Bruin defense early, get the Bruins, see if they can score points Go back and forth with Coastal Carolina. And most importantly for us as fans, let's rejoice that we can tailgate all day, or, you know, for the most part, and not have to do that in the sun. While you have to do that in the sun and it'll be hot, the game will be much better. If you're sitting in the stands in the away from the premium seating in the Rose Bowl, away from the club seating, you will have shade within the first quarter, I think. If I got my timing right, I forget when sunset happens. In Pasadena, you'll be enjoying shade for the majority of that game as opposed to sun across the whole stadium like it was last year. 4.30 at San Diego State, CBS. That's a lot of primetime viewing on a team that could be coming to the Pac-12. I think the Pac-12 would love it if San Diego State beats UCLA, funny enough, even though they want the Bruins to be good one final year, they'd probably laugh if the Aztecs finally snag a second game against the Bruins who have not ever lost to San Diego State at San Diego State, whatever they played. Remember, they played at the old the old San Diego Stadium. They played even at Dignity Health for a little bit in Carson, and now they have their own new beautiful facility at Snapdragon Stadium in San Diego. As the Aztecs look to host the Bruins, should be a fun game, 4-30. Uh, you know, it should be a fun one, a good game on, you know, wherever you're televising that one. Then NC Central, hey, we just be happy that game's not at, like, 10 a.m., right? And that there might be fans. NC Central, remember, they did beat Jackson State last year in that HBCU National Championship game, quote-unquote dubbed as the Celebration Bowl during the bowl season. And you, I, I think we'd be happy with these times and schedules. The Bruins were completely screwed when it came to getting fans in attendance during terrible game times last year. The best game time they got was the 12, 12.30 game against Utah, and we're all happy that they eventually beat the Pac-12 champions. Yet here we are, sitting here, and this schedule, I think, can lead more eyes, get more momentum for the Bruins if they start off hot, which I expect them to do. They should be 3-0, and although they could easily lose one or two of these games early. We'll have fun, and we won't be sweating as much as we were last year. And I hope, and I pray, and whatever it may be, that we have some fans in the stadium. There should be some... There should be some people in the stands. We should have fun tailgating, having a good time, and remembering what UCLA football is all about with people cheering on this new team, the old regime from pre-COVID, during COVID, after COVID. They're all gone. Now you've got this new regime, the youth, the excitement. Chip Kelly's gone out and got some top recruits. We should support this team, especially with that 730 game against Coast Carolina. There should be no reason that tailgate area in the Rose Bowl is not filled to the brims, and that's on us as fans to make that happen and do that at the Rose Bowl. That's all about it for Locked On UCLA. We're in June. We're excited. We're having a good time. Let's rock and roll and enjoy the summer of 2023. It's not summer yet, I know, but we're practically there, unofficial start of it. I'm Zach Ederson, Yoxheimer, signing off. Become an everydayer, an everyday listener of the Locked On UCLA podcast. 
We'll talk about the year in review of 2023 and 2022 to 2023, and maybe what we expect in 23 to 24, the last year UCLA is in the Pac-12. It's pretty much coming upon us, a huge change upcoming for UCLA athletics this last year of transition, and then boom, college athletics as we know it will completely shift with the SEC, the Pac-12, and all those things. We'll talk about that in weeks to come. Eight clap time, baby. Get those hands up, baby. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. U C L A. U C L A. Fight, fight, fight. This has been Locked On UCLA. Go Bruins.